peace and freedom and grace be with you. Welcome to another episode of Hard Fire. This one is very unique because tax season, as it's called, is upon us. And as many of you know who've watched the show before, I have a different perspective on taxes uh, than most individuals. I'm part of the movement called Tax Honesty. I'm here today to talk to us about that movement and to step us through the uh, various concepts and directions of that movement. Uh, I'm very privileged to introduce V, who will explain to us how to start the revolution on the tax front and what role you can take in making sure you can be honest and hold the government honest on this subject. Um, I'm very privileged, sir, to have you here. Mr. Clifton, it's my privilege to be in your show. Now, I understand you have a secret identity after all the Hollywood and uh, comic book uh, uh, homages to you have been uh, done, uh, and maybe you could tell us about that. Well, uh, gosh, how do I answer that question when I'm in disguise? <laughs> okay, well, I'll just... That's a V answer. That's right? a V answer. Um, I guess... Uh, I guess that everything starts from the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at our history, we've had plenty of, uh, plenty of people that have come and gone mm -hmm. who have used a disguising technique to actually express their views. Right. And an example of that is, of course, our founding fathers. They've used at least, a, I can think of 20 different uh, aliases, and that mm -hmm. kind of seemed unique. Yep, and they say Shakespeare may have used an alias. That may be an alias for anyone from Francis Bacon to uh, Edward de Vere. Uh, but I, my understanding is you are somewhere in Long Island um, in your normal affairs. And, yes, uh, I'm also a paralegal in mm -hmm. the real life. All right. So, uh, yes, that's, that's what I do. And uh, I'm, it's, again, it's a privilege to be in your show, sir. All right, let's go into um, the concept again for those who are not uh, familiar with the subject uh, or coming back to it for the first time or who have been, had their heads confused by different put downs of the topic. Uh, there's a, a phrase called tax honesty and there's a phrase called uh, tax protesting or tax protestor. Uh, what, are, what do those phrases mean what, and what is the relation between those two concepts? Tax honesty and tax protestor movements. Mm -hmm. I guess the IRS would like to call this particular uh, group of people as tax protesters. Uh, but they don't actually, some people, some IRS agents don't realize that the word tax protestor was actually banned mm -hmm. in 1998 with the Restructure and Reform Act. Right. Uh, as far as tax honesty is concerned, uh, tax honesty is what we call, I guess, the people in the freedom movement, this vague mm -hmm. thing called the freedom movement. Um, that's the distinction. The IRS categorizes a per particular group as tax protesters, but meanwhile that same group mm -hmm. calls themselves as tax honesty. Okay. Well, just to clarify a little more, I looked it up on Wikipedia in online, the online encyclopedia the other day, and it seemed to say a tax protester is someone who uh, does not pay or file taxes based on questioning the government's authority uh, or legality in attempting to enforce the tax uh, and challenging the jurisdiction of uh, the, the person who challenges the jurisdiction of the IRS and government in trying to impose an individual uh, direct tax on, on an individual. Um, and at least that to me defines the classical definition mm -hmm. of, of the concept. Uh, ha are there any current wrinkles or, I mean I have an idea but you, could you say if there's a, a more to it than that or? Well, Assuming that we were tax protesters, mm -hmm. I mean, the government likes to say we are tax protesters. Is that a bad thing? No, because you had Shays Rebellion, you had the Boston Tea Party, you've mm -hmm. had, of course, uh, the Whiskey Rebellion. I mean, our heritage, I, I think it was Thomas Jefferson that said, mm -hmm. you got to have rebellion now and then, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to, to keep the preserve the liberty mm -hmm. of, of, of. Right. You know, some of people would call that um, civil disobedience. Um, the, the way I've understood it from some quarters in tax honesty, so for example, uh, Robert Shilton, We the People, in one of his letters to the government, they said, we're, they're not pro we're not protesting a tax, we're not anti-law, 
we are pro-law and anti-fraud. Um, definitely excellent description is what Bob said. Yeah, I, I would mm -hmm. definitely agree with that, yeah. Because right. there's nothing to protest. I mean, mm -hmm. we're trying to use the government's, you know, we're trying to use the Constitution. We're trying to use the Internal Revenue Code. We're trying to use Supreme Court decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's funny with the Supreme Court decisions because uh, whenever you cite Supreme Court decisions, it, it, it often sometimes seems as if the government doesn't like to, you know, uh, follow those mm -hmm. Supreme Court decisions. Or even acknowledge they exist, you know. Sure. And um, uh, wh what's so interesting is I have right here in front of me a quote from, the, uh, from a Supreme Court opinion that basically says that, uh, you know, a good faith reliance on the Supreme Court can't be wrong. And the case is United States versus Mason, 412 U.S. 391. Here's what it says, John. Mm -hmm. If the doctrine of stare decisis has any meaning at all, it requires that the people in their everyday affairs be able to rely on our decisions and not be needlessly penalized for such reliance. Right. That, that basically sums it up. Yep. Um, while we're at it, quoting, um, I've quoted that before the show here, um, a particular decision that's uh, uh, of one of the federal court decisions uh, called Long versus Rasmussen, which says, the revenue laws are a code or system in regulation of tax assessment and collection. They relate to taxpayers and not to non-taxpayers. The latter are without their scope. No procedure is prescribed for non-taxpayers and no attempt is made to annul any of their rights and remedies in due course of time uh, of law, excuse me. With, the, with them, Congress does not assume to deal and they are neither the subject or the object of the revenue laws. Now, um, what that basically means, for example, is that one, if one is in the category of non-taxpayer, all the revenue laws, procedures, enforcements, uh, assessment, and other nonsense is without the scope. They don't apply to that person. And we're talking about the applicability of the uh, revenue laws as applied to individuals and not uh, about defying the laws or um, being a conscientious uh, objective. objective right. All right. So um, that's the basic difference um, between two. And, and how this works in real life, I, here's my definition. Um, some people who have, um, you know, challenged the legality of the, uh, the tax have corresponded with the government and bring, bring up these points. And what happens is the government sends a letter back, a form letter basically saying um, very bland, generalistic statements uh, like your arguments are frivolous, uh, they have been consistently uh, refuted Rejected by, by the, the courts, courts yes. et cetera. Now, and, and that's how they've dealt traditionally with tax protesters. Um, more recently, tax honesty individuals do things like, instead of trying to prove you're, you're not liable, put the burden of proof up on the charging party, the appropriate person, and say, um, okay, could you please show me, uh, prove to me that I am liable. Let them do the proving. Uh, and get a request and get your request answered by the government about uh, where they draw their jurisdiction uh, to apply the laws to you. Um, many of us who've done that have found that they can't answer that question and they can't call that uh, an argument because it's a request for information or a request for documentation and therefore uh, they're in a bit of a quandary because now they've lost their edge and in, in, in their ability to put out these um, catchphrases that um, affect the movement. Absolutely. Um, well, what I want to try to do here is, is have you explain, as a revolutionary uh, of sorts, um, how we should step through, how the individual who has no understanding necessarily of this, apart from this introductory statement, how do they proceed to establish their non-taxpayers for the purposes of, of not being within the scope of the, uh, the revenue laws? How do they um, proceed? It's a very interesting question, and it's very delicate. It requires a delicate answer. When folks step into this movement and try to honestly what, you know, do the right thing that they feel, mm -hmm. they'll face some sort of obstacle. In yeah. other words, there are a lot of beliefs in this system, mm -hmm. in this particular, uh, this vague thing that we call that the tax honesty movement or this freedom movement. If I were to suggest uh, a particular uh, suggestion, 
uh, to whenever you hear, whenever the average person hears a premise, for instance, uh, taxation is voluntary, which is another big issue. Why are taxes voluntary? Mm -hmm. And it's just so sad that when you actually consult with these people uh, and try to ask them the question as to why is it, you know, what conclusions have you reached or what documents have you relied upon from the government to reach such a conclusion? Or for instance, take a big one, uh, the right to petition. Mm -hmm. If you have a right to petition, what documents have you relied upon? What uh, legal information can you stand by and say, here is the evidence, here is my beliefs, show me where I'm wrong. I guess the, the important is, to sum it up, the important thing is whatever you believe, back it up by some sort of legal citation. That's a very important uh, topic. Right. Yes, a statement of beliefs is very important. Uh, I, I, that, and, and that is part of the classic approach and, um, and it's a great starting point because that is one of the basic issues. Absolutely. I, I think the um, different approaches sometimes are uh, thought to be in conflict with one another when really they're different fronts on the same war, uh, a battle to um, regain our freedom, you know, through the freedom movement. Uh, I would wonder, you know, um, you know, if you um, are a support all three or four aspects of this, you know, like you, you are a supporter of the um, movement uh, by the We the People organization. Oh, absolutely. All right, absolutely. who are doing a right to petition suit that's and there are the plenty court. of other sites that have the same particular mm -hmm. goal, and uh, I guess they're involved in some sort of petitioning mm -hmm. process as well. Yep. Um, I, I say that there are at least two other fronts, and I, the briefly, the one is the administrative um, battle. That is, um, instead of the battling with legal arguments, there's this issue of, uh, despite your one's claims that you're not under the law, many people who proceed um, pursue this matter um, uh, by not paying and not filing. Um, have given the game away in other ways, in an administrative way, by signing forms uh, or allowing other people to um, submit forms to the IRS that create a presumption. Um, well, the IRS always likes to presume things. Yeah, that, that, that they are, you know, that they are liable for taxes. Uh, and the person didn't ever respond to those statements or ever contradict them or overrule them, uh, and therefore it creates what we call an equitable uh, claim of tax liability. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't have the, the phrasing precise, but that kind of thing is the stuff that um, is laid against a person um, when um, things go to a serious level, like a court trial or over tax evasion. Absolutely. Um, and the, the willfulness is a big issue on that. Mm -hmm. And it, what, what's so interesting is, again, just, and this is somewhat in conjunction to what you're saying, mm -hmm. another case, United States versus Bishop, 412 U.S. 346. The requirement of an offense committed willfully is not met if a taxpayer has relied on good faith or a prior decision of this court, or a non-taxpayer, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. it goes right back to relying upon what, the, uh, what government documents there are available to support your conclusions, mm -hmm. because the, the problem is, and I don't mean to certainly be particularizing or mm -hmm. criticizing folks that mm -hmm. may be there, out there in the movement, uh, but some folks, what they like to do is they just like to reach conclusions without having some sort of, yeah. uh, you know, historical merit. Mm -hmm. And that's where many of the arguments have been refuted uh, by someone who's been more careful with, um, you know, looking at the statutes and the decisions uh, and um, the regulations relating to this, uh, and, and then people get caught. Do, um, in sure. that situation. Uh, and what, what, there's, there's actually, if you folks have, if, I don't know if any of the viewers have heard, but uh, we have plenty of decisions, where we have plenty of instances where an average person like you and me, who mm -hmm. would actually go into court, mm -hmm. prove to a jury that these are my beliefs because such and such and such, mm -hmm. and they've actually come out, you know, uh, they've come out winners. For instance, uh, back in 1993, you had Lloyd Long, mm -hmm. uh, just very recently you had Vernice Coogan. Okay. Uh, and what do these folks do? They've relied upon government documents, yes. and they use the government's own. Excellent. You know, and um, that's that we're fighting back, and we're getting some victories. Uh, I want to break at this moment to uh, remind the audience that uh, this issue, among many issues, uh, is one of the fronts in which the freedom battle is being fought. 
uh, one of the organizations in New York that is in an organized way working to try to preserve freedom, or as I said in a previous campaign, trying to bring back freedom to New York, is the Libertarian Party of New York. I think you should look at our website at um, ny.lp.org to find out about the Libertarian Party and how it's trying to restore freedom in New York State. And um, join the party. Become um, active in its um, discussion groups and in its um, chapter meetings. Uh, become a person who um, is involved and informed on these liberty issues. And then you will be able to share in the battle and the victory in bringing freedom back to New York. Uh, you can also contact, uh, if you were in Manhattan, uh, the Manhattan Libertarian Party at manhattanlp.org. Uh, on this particular issue, if you want more information, there are several um, major sites to look at. Um, one of, uh, a couple of my favorites are um, givemeliberty.org, uh, uh, which discusses the Schultz movement by Robert Schultz and the We the People organizations. Uh, there's famguardian.org, which is a site put out by uh, a gentleman um, in Chris. Chris Hansen out in, on the West Coast, which is excellent and very, very thorough on all these issues. Um, there's a little more controversial site called LostHorizons.net, which talks about a very simplified process by which one can begin to take back uh, their liberty by getting their taxes money back and, and including a full refund of all taxes paid uh, to the federal government. Um, I hope that you take advantage of those sites and, and find out how you can invest yourself in restoring freedom to New York and to America. Um, but just to recap here, there, there are people who have been fighting the fight, going to court um, to win um, this battle legally by presenting their beliefs. Two things, though, have to be brought up here. Um, in most of these cases now, um, when it gets to federal courts, you have a strange situation where the judge prevents, very often prevents an individual from presenting any legal evidence in defense of their position or their beliefs. And therefore, the jury, in not, a, not being in a position to see the evidence, has to rule on uh, the charges, basically, as they've been laid out or, or, or the facts has been relayed to them by the judge. And those people end up going to jail. I, I guess perhaps one, again, this, I cannot back this up, but mm -hmm. I, I have a certain hypothesis of why this happens. I guess people, uh, in certain t s situations, what they try to do is, let's say, if I were a defendant, mm -hmm. I cannot go to a jury and say, this is the law. I can tell you my belief of the law, and mm -hmm. once I explain my belief, the jury must decide if that is a reasonable belief. Yeah. So, uh, again, I, I cannot, I don't have first-hand experience mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, actually uh, viewing a willful failure to file tax trial, mm -hmm. but uh, from what I've read, especially from those two decisions that uh, where their acquittals mm -hmm. were, uh, the attorney argue that you know actually during direct examination, the attorney plenty of times that you know I guess reemphasized that are you going to be telling the jury what the law is? No, I'm going to tell you my belief of the law, and mm -hmm. the jury has to decide whether that's reasonable or not. Right. Um, so I guess it's it's a due process issue. I mean, um, uh, yes, you know, yes. the best way to fight mm -hmm. is, I guess, in the due process way. I think that's um, a, a big part of the other battle, the, the non-legal battle, where, where before it gets to a courtroom, a person simply tries to administratively mm -hmm. establish their due process rights come before any of this train of administrative procedures that establish all these presumptions that a person is liable. Uh, you know, whether it's um, the, the forms that are, have pre, the IRS forms that have the, the phrases taxpayer and um, liability and all that, all that pre-printed on it. So if a person signs such a form, you're basically agreeing to the presumption that you have a tax liability and that you're um, a taxpayer. Well, what, what's so interesting as well is, uh, I mean, sometimes there are issues where the government is actually in contradiction with itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, just take a very v basic example, uh, you know, the income tax system, like the income tax, what is it, is it a direct tax or is it an indirect tax? There are many circuits that say it's an indirect tax, there are many circuits that say it's a direct tax. My understanding is the IRS code um, defines income different ways depending on where you look in the, in the, in the, in the code. And uh, actually, the, 
what's what, what as 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 amazing as this sounds, Mr. Clifton, the mm -hmm. word income is not even defined in the Internal Revenue Code. Oh, okay. I mean, it's just applied in different ways. It, it, it's it looks it, it and because it isn't defined, it it seems to be different in different parts of it. Uh, well, uh, if, if 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 Congress can't define it, yeah. If the executive branch can't define it, I guess it will be up to the judiciary to somehow mm -hmm. give it a coin. And in this case, there are many cases that say it's a corporate profit. Mm -hmm. Um, yep, and, and again, this, this creates that issue of uh, presumption. The, presumption. Um, the other part of this is again what happens in a courtroom. I was starting to say this before. Uh, it, the, the, you've got one issue with the judge not allowing um, legal exhibits uh, or a real appeal to the law as evidence. Uh, you've got the other situation where uh, because somebody else said you owe taxes, uh, that, that somebody submitted a W-2 to the government or somebody uh, submitted a, a 1099 or whatever, uh, or because you said it by inadvertently signing off on documents of the IRS that imply in the wording that you owe a tax, um, they present all this uh, equitable administrative evidence that you owe the tax. And then a person, because they never rebutted that evidence, um, finds themselves just being convicted on that, because, especially since they can't present their legal information. That, that, well, that's the nucleus of the issue. I mean, if mm -hmm. you cannot present yourself, if you cannot somehow uh, explain what your beliefs are, mm -hmm. you're going to have a bumpy road ahead of you. Right. So, I mean, let's mention one other approach here. Um, be because this is a vast subject in terms of really studying the, all the statutes, the case law, the code, the regulations, blah, 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 blah some people have decided to not cover the, the light circuit. They, they decided to just go for the light switch. And um, we've had an individual on the show, uh, I won't mention names, who's presented a different point of view where you simply present, uh, submit a form every year uh, with an affidavit, um, basically where you, the, the standard IRS 4852 form where you can just repudiate all these false presumptions that's, that, that you have a liability based on this W-2 and that 1099. And um, at least what some people have found when they've done this approach is, is a form of de facto in an informational return uh, is that the government goes right ahead and submits them in due course of time um, their, own, their money back, uh, including Social Security taxes. Um, they get uh, a refund or a refund minus what the IRS consumes as penalties you know, uh, for, for, uh, for the lateness or whatever. Um, but my point is, is this is, would be absolutely impossible for them to do if a person actually owed the money. <laughs> so uh, you go. so yeah. if a person simply repudiates what they said they, uh, what somebody else said that they owed um, on a standard IRS forms, which IRS is supposed to have to honor, um, that just sort of disposes of the whole problem. Um, now, I, I know there may be some other issues with this approach, but um, uh, it, it certainly makes it simple for the average person to then proceed uh, to try to do this you know, and, and try to combat the Leviathan and um, get their freedom back, beginning with their property. Um, what do you think of um, this approach in general? Just as far as, well, I kind of boil it down to one thing. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was Mr. Hendrickson that has somehow uh, A book uses called that Cracking the Code. Cracking the Code. Well, in my, and to tell you the truth, if, if there's certain conclusions that he's reached mm -hmm. and if he's using government documentation to back up whatever reason, I think mm -hmm. he is because he obvi obviously if he's using forms mm -hmm. and, I, and if he's attaching something that somehow supports his belief system and backs that belief up with some sort of uh, government documents or mm -hmm. Supreme Court opinions, uh, why not? Very well. Um, without going into the details of this, and because with all the different approaches, there are pluses and minuses, uh, you know, uh, it, and, and you can wonder whether that's going to stay uh, viable. Or what if somebody switches, changes the light circuit mm -hmm. on uh, through which this light switch works? You know, sure, <laughs> that, that he's sure, found. sure. Uh, then uh, I think then a person will have to go back to knowing the law, all the stuff, uh, as uh, you've endeavored to learn. Um, the legal approach has the problem of the long, thunderous delay it takes, for example, for this right to petition suit to finally... Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, intentional. I think it was uh, Johnny Cochran, mm -hmm. uh, I think in his book, A Way of Life, I think mm -hmm. he wrote a book, and usually he says that uh, during his experience, uh, 
again, I cannot cite it word for word, but I'm very positive that it exists in his book, that usually the court systems, if they want to ignore an issue, mm -hmm. what they'll probably do is they'll somehow ease, ease it up. In other words, they try to ease down the tension that it builds up. I mean, yeah, 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 we're going to sue, we're going to sue, we're going to win, we're going to win this battle. It goes on and on because the way, I guess they, they, they know how human behavior works. Government knows how human behavior works. Yeah. And as time goes on, then people start to get lazy and start mm -hmm. to not do their work again. And I guess that, that's probably a reason why it's taking so long. I mean, That's why they stall or sometimes our IRS and government officials are abusive about not responding to people or uh, intimidating people because they know most people don't want to sweat the details and don't want to hang in there, you know, to fight for their rights. Well, I mean, again, I have a, while I agree with your uh, statement, mm -hmm. I might also add that, you know, uh, just think about it. I'm, let's say if I was an IRS agent and if I have this, oh goodness, my, uh, it's like a 20 page document. Am I going to sit there and read through that yeah. while I have billions of other tax? But mm -hmm. I mean, they're gonna, just going to put it aside and they're going to say, well, I don't want to deal with it. Well, if they say that, then I guess we win, don't we? Yeah. Well, so. quickly, because we're, we're really running out of time, amazingly. Time flies. Um, you are the you are going to be in D.C. Oh, absolutely. Um, in March, I understand. I mean, you were there last November. We were there. And, and was, can you briefly tell us, uh, we've got one minute, uh, about what's com coming up? Um, well, with, we're, gonna, we're expecting 1,000 Vs in December. I'm sorry, rather. Uh, March. Ma ma um, some, some, somewhere in March. End of March. End of March. Uh, to, for more information, givemeliberty.org. And there's going to be a lot of Vs. Mm -hmm. We're trying to have a big turnout to somehow express the message that we're trying to give out. Yep, and uh, to get more which attention the to the uh, right to petition process. Right, yep. which is a very important uh, right in the Constitution. I mean, you have a right to mm -hmm. question your government. We do, and I want to, and just to be clear, you're not going to bomb any building over absolutely there. Absolutely not, <laughs> no, because- uh, You're not going to throw that, any knives at anybody. Uh, absolutely uh, not. Even if they deserve it. You know? No, well, you know, uh, I guess we would have to have the Declaration of Independence answer that question. Yep. That's but certainly, there, there are no, there's not going to be any sort of, some sort of, uh, you know, like the V in for Vendetta movie. We're not going to have any. All right. Absolutely not. Well, that's, that, 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 <laughs> uh, I feel relieved. I thank you for your presence here, and I wish all of our viewers uh, come back for yet another exciting adventure uh, or exciting episode <laughs> of Hard Rock. <laughs>